Hello, Students of Dynamics. This is Dr. Dan Baker with a video today talking about the acceleration-based equations for bodies with slipping motion going on between the rigid bodies. This is in the relative motion chapter of dynamics, and we're in the last section, and we're going to incorporate the biggest equation that you've seen to date in this section. So we'll sketch things out, we'll relate things to things you already know, we'll build upon all this information to get you where you need to go. So the situation that we are going to analyze today is going to be the same four bar linkage that we looked at for velocity. So that system looked like the following. Now make sure when you draw this diagram, I would draw it at least half the width of your paper. We're actually going to add about 13 vectors to this drawing. Okay, so draw it fairly large. So let's go down here with a pin in the lower right. Here is that slotted member. So this is pin A. We called the end of it out here C. Now there is a slot here in a C. And essentially we have drawn on top of this slot a point P. Okay, so there's my point P. And at this instant, it just so happens that there's a pin from another body. So this other body looks like the following. I'll draw it all in blue. So there's another fixed axis point. We'll call this point O. And this pin, we're going to call pin B. All right, so O and B are on the same body. A, P, and C are on the same body. And you hopefully remember from our previous lecture on this, on this topic, we wrote a relative velocity equation relating the velocity of B with the velocity of P that looks like the following. We have the velocity of B is equal to the velocity of A plus the velocity of P relative to A plus the velocity of B relative to P. Now, keeping in mind with all of these subscripts that if we multiply, we take the product of the subscripts on both sides, we fundamentally end up with B equals B. That's a good thing. Okay, It tells us that we got everything in the right order. So what we're going to do today is we're going to write an equation that is going to use the same order, these same basic subscripts. So we're going to write it for acceleration. So in the simplest form, we could write that the acceleration of B is equal to the acceleration of A plus the acceleration of P relative to A plus the acceleration of B relative to P. Okay, now that's the simplest form. Because it turns out that each one of these terms has a tangent and a normal. And that for the slipping acceleration over here, we end up with actually three different terms. We end up with a tangent, a normal, and a Coriolis. So before I get into defining this equation more, let's take a look a little bit more at this Coriolis acceleration. So in thinking about what is this Coriolis acceleration, this Coriolis acceleration is the acceleration caused by a particle moving across a rotating body. Okay, and I'll tie that over into our four bar linkages, also possibly into an additive motion. But fundamentally, one of the things we can think about as particles moving across a rotating body would be weather systems. Okay, so this is a map of something. Right, it's the globe. I've told you it has something to do with weather. See if you can look at this map and contemplate what you think it might represent. Did you come up with any ideas? It turns out to represent the eyes of tropical storms. So hurricanes or tropical storms. And what you'll notice is that there has not been a single tropical storm in recorded history that has crossed the equator. Now the reason for that turns out to be the Coriolis acceleration. Okay, so to get into that a little bit further, let's go to this link. 
So what we see in this link are a combination of two different types of data. The first kind of data is actually the wind direction all around the Earth on the day this video was recorded. Now, if you visit this same link, you'll see the weather the day that you're actually watching the link. And if we take a look at the scale, so let me pull up this um, lower corner here, we can look at the scale. We notice that in red colors, um, that that's going to be really low pressures, kind of moderate in blue, and really high pressures in yellow up to white. So going back to the view, we notice a couple things. If we look up here in the northern hemisphere, we actually don't have too many strong low pressure systems in the northern hemisphere currently. You can see one here over Scandinavia. Uh, one thing you'll notice with that low pressure system, you can wrap your fingers around in the direction of those wind vectors and see that it's rotating in a positive right-hand rule direction. See the same thing up here over Greenland, same thing over here off the coast of Japan. Okay, so those are all going to be low pressure systems. Looking at the white areas, these are high pressure systems. You'll notice they rotate in the opposite direction negative from the right hand rule here in the northern hemisphere there's a strong one there uh, that's really the strongest one i see currently now notice that not all weather systems are really tidy precise single cells things do merge together and it's fairly complicated if you look down here in the roaring 40s it's in the southern hemisphere we get some really really low pressures really strong low pressure systems, which typically are kind of storm systems. But take a look at the rotation here of these low pressure systems versus the low pressure systems in the Northern Hemisphere. You should notice they're in the opposite direction. The reason they're in the opposite direction is actually the Coriolis acceleration. Basically the axes around which these vectors are rotating are on a different aspect relative to our planet which is rotating around a vertical axis, which goes up through the middle, which causes these weather systems to rotate in opposite directions. Here's a, here's a high pressure system. This high pressure system is rotating in a positive right-hand rule direction, whereas up here in the Northern Hemisphere, a negative right-hand rule direction. So the implication of the Coriolis on weather systems is quite strong. The other thing you'll notice here along the equator, there's no strong um, high or low pressure systems, right? Essentially, there's not much rotation through here at all. So one of the reasons the weather around the equator is so stable is that there aren't these strong weather systems because the Coriolis effect essentially is balanced. There's no positive or negative effect from the Coriolis. Thus, we don't really get any induction of rotation in these weather systems around the equator. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a feel for what is the Coriolis acceleration, at least as it relates to weather. Now let's take a look at what the equation is for Coriolis acceleration. It works out to be two times the omega. Now the omega, there's different ways we can write this omega, but fundamentally, using our marker point notation, it's the omega of the body, which contains point P, and we're going to cross that into the slipping velocity. In this case, it's going to be the velocity, I'll just put velocity slip. And we'll define it more explicitly as we move forward. Okay, so it's going to be the omega of the body, which contains point P. And we're going to cross that into the velocity of the slipping velocity. In this case, it's going to be between B and P. Now, let's go ahead and add a couple of velocity terms that we will need for our acceleration equation. One of those would be our omega of OB. We also have our omega over here of AP. This is our omega of our body which contains point P. We talk about omega of, the, of P. The additional thing that we found on this problem is that our slipping velocity is coming right down this direction. This is the velocity of B relative to P, so this is that velocity of slip. Now let's go ahead and expand this equation into all the different details that are associated with it. In order to do that, I need to scroll down here just a bit, zoom out, give myself plenty of room as I write out all these different terms. All right, so we have our acceleration of B tangential. This is a vector plus our acceleration of B normal. Now notice that once again, I have picked a point which is adjacent to point P. 
Okay, I like doing that over here on the left-hand side of my equation, picking a point adjacent to point P. As I build up the motion on the right-hand side of the equation, it's basically going to start at A, go to P, and then pick up that slipping acceleration from B to P. So we have our acceleration of A tangential plus our acceleration of A normal plus my acceleration of P relative to A tangential plus the acceleration of p relative to a normal plus the acceleration of b relative to p tangential plus the acceleration of b relative to p normal plus my coriolis okay so that is all the different terms that are possible now let's go ahead and draw these and talk about which ones are going to be non-zero, which ones are going to be zero. So as we look at the acceleration of B, we can see that the acceleration of B is fundamentally in fixed axis rotation around O. Okay, and so if it's in fixed axis rotation, we know a couple things. One of those is that the tangential acceleration is going to be based upon the alpha of OB, I do need to give you that information. Let's say that the omega of OB is slowing down. Okay, so this is going to be my alpha of OB, a time rate of change of omega of OB. So I know that my tangential acceleration is going to be along the line perpendicular to this R vector. Let me add the R vector onto here, coming right up the middle. This is going to be my R of B. You could also write this if you wanted to, R of B relative to O. Same vector, point O isn't moving, and so it turns out to be an absolute vector. And so looking at that R vector, also with my alpha being positive from the right-hand rule, I end up with a relative, excuse me, an absolute tangential acceleration of, acceleration of B tangential, which is going up to the left. And then I'll have a normal acceleration coming down opposite that R vector. And so this would be my acceleration of B normal. All right, so perpendicular once again, tangent and normal. Normal acceleration always opposing the R vector. And I'll write the equations for those as we move on below. Now getting over onto the right side of the equation, we have acceleration of A tangential and A normal. Now, both of those are going to go to zero for this four bar linkage because point A is not moving. It doesn't need an acceleration to stay not moving. So therefore, those would be zero. Getting into my relative tangent and relative normal. Now, once again, point A is actually not moving. So it turns out in this system, while these are written as relative vectors, it turns out they're really the absolute accelerations for P. So they're going to be based upon an R vector, which goes from A up to P. Okay, so this is going to be my R of P relative to A, going from the fixed axis point up to point P. Now, one assumption that we typically can make in any kind of a rigid body situation is that if the alpha and omega oppose each other on one body, it is really, really likely they're going to oppose each other on the other bodies as well. And so I think it's a good assumption, at least to start with, that we would have our alpha of AP in the positive right-hand rule direction. So this term right here is going to be based upon that alpha and the R vector. And so if we know that, we know that the acceleration is going to be along that line across here. Now, I'm going to slide my vector over here to the right. Now, it is going down to the left. So think about lines of action and vectors just because things were getting a little crowded over here on the lower left. And so this would be my acceleration of P relative to A tangential. And then normal, once again, always opposes the R vector. And so it's going to come back down in this direction here. So that would be my acceleration of P relative to A normal. So I took care of this term and this term. What we have left are our slipping terms, our acceleration of B relative to P, acceleration of um, B relative to P normal, and then our Coriolis, uh, reminding ourselves that this Coriolis is going to be two times the omega of AP crossed into the velocity of B relative to P. Okay, so that'll be actually the equation for my Coriolis. 
So looking at these three terms, first of all, we have how is B going to depart from P in a tangential direction? So tangential is really looking at along this slot in the direction of motion, basically in the direction of this velocity. So if we have alphas opposing omegas, it's highly likely that if our velocity is going down to the right, our acceleration is going to come up to the left. So my acceleration of B relative to P tangential is the first term. The next term, the normal, is based upon whether the slot is linear or if it's curved. Okay, so in this case, we have a straight slot, so therefore this will go to zero because we have a straight straight slot, or basically a straight line of slippage between those. And then the Coriolis, it really just comes down to this cross product. So for crossing two omega into our linear velocity, we take a look at the drawing. We can see that our omega is down here, negative from the right-hand rule. And so if we start with a negative vector and we curl our fingers into this slipping velocity, so here we're going into the board, we curl downwards, our thumb should end up, which is our cross product, going here perpendicular to the slipping velocity. And that's going to be true 100% of the time. So essentially either is going to be here along this same line as fundamentally our, um, in this case, acceleration of P relative to A tangential, just because arm A, P, and the slot are along the same line. So it's either going to be going left or right along that line. But really it's going to be perpendicular to our omega, right, which is always in or out of the board, in or out of the screen. And this slipping velocity, which in this case is coming down toward point A. Okay, so just make sure that whatever right-hand rule technique that you use, you can cross this vector, which once again is going into the board, into the screen, into this slipping velocity, and end up with a Coriolis that's coming down and to the left from point B. All right, so to write out all the equations that go with these terms, Let's go ahead and zoom to that level there. We, from the first term here, we have our alpha of OB, and we're going to cross that into our R of B. For the next term, we have our normal. Now, the normal is always going to be the simpler form, is our omega. In this case, is going to be OB, because that's what's dictating the motion here of this fixed axis body, OB. And this can be squared times a negative r of b. Now you could use the omega cross omega cross r computations, but you get the same equation no matter what. Then that equals, we're going to put placeholders in here, 0 plus 0 plus. Now my acceleration of p relative to a, that's going to be based upon my alpha of AP, noticing it's a different body. We had OB over here on the left for point B. We now have, now have AP for um, our acceleration tangential of point P. We're going to cross that into our R of P relative to A. And then we add in our normal, and the normal is going to be our omega of the body which contains point P, so that's going to be the omega of AP squared times negative r of p relative to a. So that takes care of the normal term. I'm trying to keep these all lined up, if you notice, that this is kind of all lined up longitudinally coming across. Now the next term we have here, we typically don't know the value of this acceleration. It typically is one of the things we're solving for in a problem. So you could express this a couple of different ways. Now in this problem, I didn't give you all the geometry, so you come up with a unit vector. So for this one, I'm going to go ahead and kind of give us a generic name, acceleration of B relative to P tangential. Noting that once you know the direction of this member, that you would want to basically write a unit vector, say this angle here was 60 degrees, you could do that the x component is going to be a negative cosine of 60, and the y component is going to be a positive sine of 60. Um, those would be your i hats and your j hats, and multiply that times the magnitude of a, b, slash, p, so instead of the vector. And then getting into our last two terms, we have plus a zero for our slipping normal, plus our Coriolis, 
which is our two times omega of AP. This is a vector, and we're going to cross that with our velocity of B relative to P. If you ever get confused about which velocity to put in down here, keep in mind it's always going to be the same subscripts as these other acceleration terms. Okay, so that would be our overall equation with a number of zeros in there for this scenario. I hope that was helpful in getting you to think about relative acceleration with slipping and rotating axes. If you are in one of my classes, I provide multiple worksheets to do this same kind of analysis to draw vectors and also write out all of these equations, both for a four bar linkage situation, which is actually, this is a type of four bar linkage, also for additive motion. Additive motion is when you're adding motion of one body onto an already moving body. All right, that's it for right now. Hope you're having a great day.